Hello and welcome. Today we are going to take a closer look at the power of Nehemiah's prayer and the unveiling of God's plan in Nehemiah 2. Nehemiah's story is one of faith, determination, and the power of prayer. In chapter 2 of the book of Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah's prayer being answered in a remarkable way. Despite facing many challenges and opposition, Nehemiah's prayer for success and favor with King Artaxerxes was answered when the king granted him permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls. Nehemiah's prayer did not only reveal God's plan for him, but it also empowered him to lead the people in the monumental task of rebuilding the city walls. Through Nehemiah's unwavering faith and reliance on God, the city walls were completed in just 52 days, a feat that seemed impossible to achieve. Nehemiah's prayer not only unveiled God's plan for him, but it also brought about a transformative experience for the people of Jerusalem. In conclusion, the power of Nehemiah's prayer cannot be underestimated. It not only revealed God's plan for him, but also empowered him to achieve the seemingly impossible. Let us take inspiration from Nehemiah's story and remember the power of prayer in unveiling God's plan for our lives. Outline, I Nehemiah talks with Artaxerxes, 1-8, Seku. Nehemiah inspects the walls, 9-16, the third. Nehemiah proposes rebuilding the wall, 1720. Okay, and it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Thetan said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, of B. 5 And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. 6 And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. 7 Moreover I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me, according to the good hand of my God upon me, One, how long had it been since Nehemiah heard about the state of Jerusalem? Two, what can we learn about Nehemiah's job in this passage? Three, what caused the king to ask Nehemiah why he was sad? Eek, why was Nehemiah very afraid? Five, what can you learn about how to deal with fear from Nehemiah? Six, how did he deal with his fear? Seven, how did Nehemiah respond when the king asked him what he requested? Eight, what does his response show about his preparation on planning for this issue? 9. What do we learn from him about prayer? 10. What do we learn from him about planning and preparedness? How does prayer work together with these things? 11. What specific requests did Nehemiah make of the king? What does this show us about him? Are there any lessons we can learn from this? 12. How did the king respond to Nehemiah? Why? What principles can we learn from this? Esther 4.11. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Esther 5.1-2. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her 
and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Luke 14, 28 to 33. In this passage, Jesus talks about the importance of considering the consequences of making an important decision before making it. Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Proverbs 6, 6, 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. James 4, 13 to 15. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. One, the month Nisan. How much time had passed? Two, I had not been sad in his presence. It seems it was against court traditions for officials or nobles to be sad in the presence of the king. The official's job was to serve the king and make him happy. The king seemingly didn't want to be reminded of the troubles of his people. They were to do their jobs well and leave their problems outside the court. After all, their problems would be considered of far less importance than the very smallest of the king's own problems. In the end, this shows the perspective that the king's happiness and well-being was of primary concern. The people existed to serve the king and not the other way around. 3. The king noticed Nehemiah's sadness. He had kept it to himself for quite some time, but on this day, whether intentionally or not, his sadness was visible enough that the king noticed and commented on it. 4. Nehemiah was very much afraid. Notice his response. He wasn't excited about the opportunity to share with the king, or at least that wasn't his primary emotion. He was scared of what the king would do to him for breaking this tradition. Artaxerxes could have certainly fired him, but he could do a lot worse. He could have him executed. Kings at that time didn't require much of a reason to have people killed. But notice in the following verses how Nehemiah responded. He was scared, but he didn't let that fear control him. He didn't freeze. He didn't panic. He didn't turn around and run out of the court. Nehemiah didn't apologize and beg for forgiveness or mercy. While he was afraid, he also knew that there was an opportunity here. It was the opportunity he had been praying for, and he seized it while he could so that it would not go to waste. In fact, we will see that he was very bold. Application. Fear is a natural reaction sometimes, but God doesn't want us to allow our fear to control us. We must move past our fear to do what God wants us to do. What are some things you may be afraid or nervous about that you may need to do anyway? Sharing the gospel. Changing jobs. Making sacrifices for God's kingdom public preaching, leading a Bible study, discipling others, talking to your parents about the Lord, confronting someone in sin, speaking up against peer pressure or the evils in society, getting married. How can you be bold in these situations? 5. Nehemiah's first response to the king. Nehemiah first responds politely, let the king live forever. He lets the king know that even though he is sad, it doesn't mean he is a bad subject. He is not committing rebellion but he does have a legitimate concern. After telling the king clearly the reasons for his sadness, he then poses the king a question, why should my face not be sad? In other words, he says, I have a good reason for being sad. Application. When you pray for something, watch carefully for the answer. We don't want to pray for something and then miss it when the answer is right in front of us. 7. Nehemiah's Spontaneous Prayer. Nehemiah had already prayed about this issue, but now in the heat of the moment, he still didn't rely on his own wisdom. He tossed up one more heartfelt prayer to God. It was probably a very quick, silent prayer. And yet that prayer had power. It had power because it matched Nehemiah's life of prayer. Our life should be filled both with dedicated times of private prayer and also with those short prayers of help in times of need. If you only ask God for help in times of need and never prayed to him before, those prayers may lack the same power. God wants to see us rely on Him through prayer consistently, making it a habit rather than only turning to Him in times of intense need. Application 
We can learn from Nehemiah that we should rely on God all the time. No situation is too urgent to offer up a quick prayer of help. Our lives should, like his, be saturated with prayer. Our natural response when facing decisions, trials, temptations, or emergencies should be to say, God help me. 8. Nehemiah's Request to the King Here we see Nehemiah frankly asked for the king's permission to himself lead an expedition to repair the wall. This is a huge request. Generally, kings may be skeptical of walled cities and other nationalities that were subjugated to them. If Jerusalem was walled, logic says the people in it may decide to rebel again. But Nehemiah wasn't afraid to make big requests. Why not? We know he had already prayed about it, and I believe God had already led him to make this plan. He knew what he was going to ask before the king even asked him. William Carey said, Attempt great things for God. Ask great things of God. This should be our attitude as well. Don't ask the question, what can I do? Instead, ask the question, what needs to be done? That is the question Nehemiah asked. After he realized what needed to be done, he was bold enough to go for it. This request was also quite abnormal. There was apparently no benefit for the king. Instead, he lost a trusted official for a long time. God was obviously working. 9. How long will your journey be? Nehemiah was able to quickly give a clear answer. This clues us that he had prepared well. He had researched the situation. He knew about how long it would take to get there, how long it would take to build the wall, and how long it would take to go back. Trusting in God is not an excuse for a lack of preparation. Instead, it is a reason to prepare all the more, because we believe that God will give us a chance to put those plans into action. 10. Nehemiah's Additional Requests Nehemiah then asks for letters of protection that he can give to all the regional rulers of the lands he will pass through. That is bold, but he doesn't stop there. He then asks for another letter, this one to be given to Asaph, to ask for materials to use in the rebuilding of the wall. Let's pause and think about this for a moment. How did he even know the name of Asaph? It would seem unlikely he would haul the materials for the wall the entire five-month journey from Susa. That would mean that Asaph was likely the keeper of a forest much closer to Jerusalem. It would also seem unlikely that Nehemiah and the other officials would automatically know the names of all the people in the huge Persian government. That would mean that Nehemiah had already researched this issue ahead of time. He had gotten all the info he would need to communicate to the king when the opportunity came up, so that he would know exactly what to say. Imagine what the result would have been if the king asked him what he wanted, and Nehemiah said, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it yet. Let me get back to you. The result would not have been good. By having a detailed plan ready to go, Nehemiah demonstrated to the king he was competent to be entrusted with this task. He gave confident answers, which in turn made the king confident that he knew what he was doing. Also, this request for materials was the largest yet. Not only did Nehemiah ask the king for permission to rebuild the wall, he asked him to finance it. And the king said, sure. Wow. The only conclusion he could make is that, the good hand of my God was with me. Nehemiah had prepared the best he could, but he gave all the credit to God for his success. Application. Like Nehemiah, we must also prepare ahead for the tasks God has in store for us. We must be diligent. We can and should make plans. When we do, we must pray to God for wisdom. We must not leave God out of the plans. We shouldn't make plans on our own and then ask God to bless those. God should be part of the process from beginning to end. A lazy person says, I will trust in God. I don't need to make plans. I don't need to prepare. A prideful person says, I will make and execute my plans on my own. I don't need God. We don't want to be prideful or lazy. Finally, we should give the glory to God for the results and not take credit for ourselves. Eleven. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. Thirteen. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Fran. 
Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. What do we learn in verse 10 about the cause for Nehemiah's visit? What reaction we see in verse 10? Why may Nehemiah have gone to survey the wall at night and not tell anyone? What else can we learn from his character from his survey of the wall? Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Isaiah 41, 10, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, I am with you. I will uphold you. Ezra 1, 5, then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Ezra 7, 6. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Proverbs 24, 10. If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 1 Peter 4, 12, 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. One. Nehemiah goes on the journey. The king had sent officers of the army with him to keep him safe on the way, another example that God had made the king favorably disposed to him. 2. Verse 10. In this verse we see the beginnings of what will turn out to be very pesky opposition. These were both likely officials. Note that in verse 9, Nehemiah was showing the governors the letters from the king. He hadn't told others about his purpose yet. Both Sanballat and Tobiah heard about his plan in verse 9 meaning that they were officials with some high-ranking, perhaps even regional governors. 3 verses 11 to 16. Nehemiah spends the first three days planning and surveying. He wanted to know exactly what the project in front of him would require. He doesn't make rash decisions. A leader should understand all the potential difficulties and obstacles in front of him. He wouldn't want to propose his plan, only to be surprised, when someone pointed out a huge problem he knew nothing about. Application. Don't be hasty. Don't make rash decisions, and don't act without thinking and researching. Before making important decisions, spend the necessary time required to gather all of the relevant information you will need. 4. Nehemiah went secretly at night. He wasn't ready to tell others his plan yet, so he did his surveying at night. As a leader, he knew it was important to make a clear and complete proposal. That required not saying anything until he was ready to say everything. Seventeen. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Eighteen. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nineteen. But when Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Twenty then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven he will prosper us, therefore we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial, in Jerusalem. How did Nehemiah communicate with the people? What was his plan? How long had it been since they had first returned to Jerusalem? Why hadn't the wall been rebuilt before? Why was Nehemiah successful in convincing the people this time? What do we learn from him about leadership? How can you learn from this to be a better leader? What opposition did they face? How did Nehemiah respond to the opposition? How should we respond to opposition? Cross-references. 
John 14, 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. One verses 17, 18. Nehemiah proposes rebuilding the wall. It is likely that these verses are a summary of what he said and not a complete record. We know that Nehemiah was a detail-oriented person. We also see that in verse 18 he tells them about the king's words, but he doesn't record that conversation here. The main point of his conversation was threefold. Firstly, the what. He proposed rebuilding the wall together. Second, the why. Jerusalem was in a bad situation. Thirdly, the who. God. God was with them, and this was all the reason they needed to just do it. He said, let us arise and build. I love the word arise. They had to stop sitting down. They had to stop being complacent. They had to take action. They had to be unified. Every work for God is like this. Application. We may not have a wall to build, but we all have something to build for God. What does he want you to build? Are you building it? Are you building your kingdom or God's kingdom? Building for God takes an effort. It is not easy. It is a lot easier to sit and do nothing. People sit about one third of their lives. The lesson for you today might be very simple. God may want you to arise and build for him. Let's together put our hands to the good work. In conclusion, the power of Nehemiah's prayer in unveiling God's plan in Nehemiah 2 serves as an inspiring reminder of the impact of prayer in the life of a believer. It encourages us to approach God with faith, persistence, and a willingness to align ourselves with his will. As we follow Nehemiah's example, we can experience the incredible ways in which God works through prayer to bring about his purposes in the world.